Hello, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this second annual end of year review of German politics with Derek Scali. Uh, something I do hope will be an annual affair going forward. Thanks to everyone for being able to join us and most especially to Derek. Um, Derek obviously is the Berlin correspondent for the Irish Times and very generous, but this year and at various occasions in the past to take time out to be with us and to inform us. And it's really appreciated. Derek is going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then this will be followed, of course, for the all important questions and answers with you, our audience. As ever, you can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And do please send in questions as we go along. And they may become pertinent over the course of Derek's uh, intervention, as well as afterwards in the Q&A proper. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. And as ever, you can join the discussion using uh, Twitter slash X using the handle at IIEA. So to briefly introduce our speaker before handing over to him, Derek Scully is a native of Dublin and he studied at DCU and at Humboldt University in Berlin. He's been Irish Times correspondent in Berlin since 2001, covering politics, business and culture. And he's a regular contributor to German news, to German news outlets as well, including Die Zeit Weekly and Deutschlandfunk VDR Radio. He reports regularly from Northern and Central Europe, and he's also the author of The Best Catholics in the World, published by Penguin. Derek, thanks a million as ever for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. It's good that uh, some good did come out of the pandemic, having gatherings like this, so it's good to keep up, up the tradition. Anyway, um, preparing the talk, I just started drowning in things I could talk about. Um, in the last Merkel term was uh, almost... Uh, politics free zone I felt in many ways and now we just have like like extreme politics uh, there's literally so much to talk about even since last year and things are looking very different um from a Berlin perspective and perhaps from your perspective looking in on Germany um they always say in journalism say say the most important things first so for anyone who's going to drop off the call discreetly halfway through some thoughts just to start us off and then I'll go into some of the details um Looking at Olaf Scholz recently, looking at him getting more and more tired, more and more ashen faced. I mean, I certainly don't want to be him. I don't think anyone wants to be the German Chancellor at this point. You've got historical trauma where Russia ruptured. You've got historical trauma with Israel uh, also shattered and and creating shockwaves right through your political system. Um, and and it's really shaken to the core his three way coalition two years ago. They came to power, um, promising you know. Uh, a break from Angela Merkel's sort of politics as the art of the possible. They were going to pick up an awful lot of what was left lying by Merkel after four terms. They wanted to be a, a green, progressive, transformatory climate change government, also with a with an eye on the socially weak. Um, so they wanted to kind of square the circle, social democrats and greens, uh, a proven track record in power during the Schroeder years. Uh, Schroeder and Joschka Fischer, and then bringing in, to, unfortunately, to bring up numbers, the FTP, with whom the F SPD have contributed, uh, collaborated in the past. Uh, but this idea of sort of a progressive green government has just gone out the window, and the coalition partners are barely talking. And when I look at Charles these days, I often think of that, to, 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 to to boulderize that phrase i look at his politics as his coalition's politics as the art of the impossible he literally has to try and square several circles even just on a domestic front regardless even disregarding for a moment um russia israel and and the rest and we're really heading into a polycrisis situation and i it, from the tone and from people i talk to and just a general feeling of exhaustion and hopelessness and even a very typical German feeling self-loathing. And um, when you start seeing the self-loathing editorials piling into the newspapers, definitely reminds me of 2003, um, the end of the Schroeder era, where everything just seemed to be, one thing seemed to be triggering the next. It was just like a, a, a domino game of crises. One crisis was collapsing the next, into the next, into the next. And eventually Schroeder had to um, risk it all and he lost very closely but he lost uh, on social transformation now it's it's a bigger it's about preserving germany's industrial base in the 21st century by balancing its emissions it's about um, retooling its military to make it uh, a player worth talking about in central europe and a nato member uh, worth the membership fee and and with israel yeah we don't even know we can't even begin to see where germany's position is going 
we know we've heard a lot of the familiar refrains, but how long that can hold up and whether the population is behind it is something I'll come back to later on. Um, we've got destabilizing forces coming in. We've got the AFD um, rising and rising, and we've got uh, the dark horse, Sarah Wagenknecht, extreme left person launching her own party, collapsing her previous party, and just sort of sending further shockwaves through the German political landscape. And this is a country that loves a nice, stable political landscape, it likes parties where they are, and nothing changes too much. But things are speeding up. Um, there are external shocks are called the internal shocks and vice versa. Um, so it's a very destabilizing, destabilized, exhausting situation. I won't cover everything that's uh, been on my desk in the last 12 months, but um, um, I, I guess we spot, started where we were a year ago. The government comes into office, it has its grand plans, and then we know Russia had other plans. Schultz came along and gave his Zeitenwende watershed speech promising earth shattering taboo breaking German exports of weapons of war to Ukraine and to spend 100 billion and overhaul the German military. So we're, we're two years on, we're halfway through the Schultz term, um, nearly two years on from that big speech. How are things looking? Um, I was looking at some of the numbers. Uh, Germany is still exporting huge amounts to Ukraine, um, despite the uncertainties of, of, of the situation in the US. Germany from a slow start, a very slow start. Um, just this year alone, 5.4 billion in arms for Ukraine. So we're talking 80 fighting vehicles, 30 battle tanks, um, 60 all-terrain vehicles, more battle tanks, more arms, spare parts. Um, they've created a tank repair facility. I think it's in Poland uh, on the Ukrainian border. Um, Germany is up and running on this front. It's, it really can't, I think it, it, it doesn't need to hide itself, hide its light under a bushel. It very much is doing the impossible, what couldn't have been even considered two years ago. Um, this is certainly not what the Greens got into power for, but they and the other two coalition partners are very united on this. Um, and I think Ukraine has stopped complaining about Germany as they did in the past. I mean, there could always be more, but I think considering where Germany's come from and considering the state of its own military, it's done quite a bit. That's the second point. Um, this, the second part of the, the Zeitenwende was reforming the military. Um, yeah, it's been fascinating. German troops are now have been serving on the ground in places like Latvia, in um, Lithuania and Poland, and they're being asked to stay on. I mean, this is, you know, Zeitenwende, a, a complete watershed that neighbours of Germany are asking the military to come in and to stay. Um, in terms of spending overall, things aren't looking so good. Um, they they pledged to meet the 2% NATO uh, target, um, and now they've changed it to say we want to meet the 2% target over a five-year period. Um, when you ask Olaf Scholz about 2%, he says they will meet 2% spending target, 2% of GDP, obviously, uh, over what he calls a planning horizon. So that to me sounds like medium term, not annual. And that was even before um, the Constitutional Court ruling on debt spending, which I will come to at the end of the talk. So everything is quite up in the air. But when I talk to people I know in the military, they say, well, nothing has arrived here. It's been one way traffic out of the depots, out of the armories towards Ukraine. Most of the equipment isn't being replaced. And Germany's at the back of the queue for a lot of the heavy, heavy goods. So um, I don't really see how the site and vendor can come about, but just practically it just doesn't seem like it's it's got legs at the moment um so there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of goodwill but um the focus seems to be on exporting to ukraine and um it's not at all clear if they will have money the the, the promise is that the site vendor took place outside the budget but not in any of the off balance sheet pro uh, issues that have been raised by uh, the constitutional court which i will get back to so the money seems to be there but actually finding ways to spend it seems to be procurement seems to be an issue finding suppliers is an issue and germany was very late to the game other other countries were already ordering shortly after uh, the russian invasion what we also got this year was a new german foreign policy document and well, too, we had one Germany generally and sort of fleshing out the Zeitenwende and then one on China. I won't go into the details, but um, I found the documents nothing terribly interesting. They're more prescript or more descriptive than prescriptive. Um, Germany said its priority is to protect our country, its free democratic order and our values. We don't say. Um, and for now, uh, it defines Russia as for now the most significant threat to peace and security. 
in the Euro Atlantic area. Um, Charles is talking about sort of an integrated approach, bringing in cybersecurity, countering disinformation, and um, food supply, medication, and he agrees with the Green uh, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock about climate issues, climate security being also a national security issue. Um, and she, Annalena Baerbock, has, I think, proven a lot of her critics wrong. She seems to have, uh, for most of her partners, considered uh, a policy heavyweight. And um, in Israel, she was very quick um, to get there. I think she's made at least four visits since then. Um, on the foreign policy in a general sense, obviously before October 7th, she said Germany's priorities would be uh, security issues would be uh, expanded to include climate change, biodiversity, food supplies and security in the 21st century, she said, is more than diplomacy and military. Um, it's um, it's about uh, providing agencies. Uh, she's, she wants to basically retool German agencies so they're all working with each other, that they're spending the money more efficiently. Um, and that every spending decision has to consider, uh, every government spending decision will have to consider geopolitical issues. Um, China was interesting um, only because for once they finally had a China policy, but after months of basically committee thinking between several ministries, in particular the Chancellery and the Foreign Ministry, it turned out to be a rather unexciting um, document. But it does describe China as acting time and again counter to our interests and values. Uh, uh, but then in the next sentence of the document, it says China is a partner with whom, without whom many global challenges and crises cannot be resolved. Uh, Beijing was paranoid about this document. I don't think they had much to worry about when it finally came out. Um, and uh, Scholz has always been very clear about this. He, he says, on the one hand, our firm transatlantic anchor is not to be questioned. Um, but well, working uh, with Washington on the one hand does not preclude Germany from having its own ideas about China and fostering sort of a multilateral world order and new relationships with other non-Chinese Asian partners. Um, so that's, the, that's, let's say, policy, some of the major policy things. And what about the politics? Um, we're in a bit of a brief, quiet period. We're going to have another run of state elections next year. The German system, as you know, is federalized. So you have your federal elections. We had them two years ago. We'll have them in another two years. And then staggered through the four-year federal election period are your state elections, um, which uh, are sort of a, a holdover, or it's a it's an inheritance from the allies. The idea is keeping state elections keeps keeps politicians honest at some some everyone in your party uh, somebody in their party is having an election somewhere so you might want to take that into mind it's supposed to stabilize the german political system but what we're seeing is yeah the old stabilities the old certainties are no longer um there and um, this year we had an uh, election in bavaria we had um, nearly 15 percent for the afd that's slightly above the national um polling numbers um, in Hesse, where Frankfurt is, 18% uh, for the AfD. Um, so I think that definitely, if there was any doubt, this is the year when the AfD finally became pan-German party. It is already represented in all federal, in all, excuse me, in all state parliaments, but um, there was a lot of Western Germans in particular, they had this sort of, they were lying to themselves saying, oh, the East Germans, AfD, in some states, it's twice that, you know, it's into 30%. Um, but there's still this idea, oh, they're these crazy Easterners, but I would always count them. Well, you know, most of the AfD leaders are actually from West Germany, you know, so um, they may be having their success in the East, but um, these are your people. And I think with the Bavarian and Hessen elections in particular, um, you've seen that it's, um, the taboo has gone out of it. Um, the, the arguments are still there. Is this a protest vote? Hugely, yes. some of it is a protest vote. Every time the coalition falls out, you can see the AfD going up, ticking up two points in polls. Um, but they uh, are increasingly stabilizing themselves, establishing themselves. Um, and we're going to see next year, um, I think next year is gonna be crucial for the AfD and for the German political system because we have elections in uh, Saxony, Brandenburg and Thuringia. Those are three uh, eastern states. I was just looking at the numbers today in Saxony. Um, they're going to the polls the 1st of September, 35% for the AfD, the most popular party, 35, more than a third. Uh, in Brandenburg, that's the state that surrounds Berlin. Uh, they go to the polls on the 22nd of September, 27%. Uh, and Thuringia, which is um, sort of central German state, 
it has AFD polling at 34%. And Turingia is important because they've already gotten the first AFD county councillors there. So the AFD policy uh, has actually been to decentralise and to go local, go as local as possible. And it's starting to pay off for them that there seems to be a lesser taboo of voting for the AFD in your county council municipal elections. Um, and But obviously they're hoping uh, that the polls for them in these three federal states will uh, hold steady, which means um, either you have all of the other parties combining their forces to keep the AFD out, which will probably just boost the AFD even more because it will be uh, bickering, bickering coalitions, um, or somebody will have to break a taboo and go into politics, go into government with the AFD. So it's really all to play for. Uh, they're 10 years in existence and already three federal states, really, they, they could be um, calling the shots by this time next year. What could spoil the fun for them is a lady known as Sarah Wagenknecht. Some of you will be familiar with her, um, Red Sarah, some, some of them call her. And um, while everyone else was out celebrating the fall of the wall in 1989, Sarah Wagenknecht was sitting at home reading Immanuel Kant. Um, she joined the SED ruling party in East Germany shortly after the Berlin Wall fell. So I think you can call her um, she's more a Trotsky, uh, she's more a contrarian than a, a Trotsky. She, some people say she's an old-fashioned Stalinist. Um, she would consider herself a lifelong Marxist, and she has been the thorn in the flesh of the left party, Die Linke. Earlier this week, Die Linke ceased to exist as a parliamentary party in the Bundestag, and it's largely because of Sarah Wagenknecht. Uh, in recent years, she's she's always been a hard leftist, very uncompromising, whereas a lot of the Berlin and Bundestag linker were very much uh, pragmatists. She's sort of a a, a pure uh, a purist, let's put it that way, ideological purist. And um, she has been fighting her party for the last two or three years, accusing them of turning the party into sort of a woke um, uh, activist party that's more interested in pronouns than welfare and, and this type of thing. It's, it's a play you, you'll be familiar with from other countries, but um, what she's done is she's walked out. She's taken, um, I think it's about nine or ten uh, MPs with her, which collapsed the Linka parliamentary party, so they lose a lot of their privileges and speaking rights. And she is going for broke. She's hoping to run in the European elections next year. She's hoping in, in some of the autumn state elections. And then, of course, the year after next, you have the federal elections. So this is all without a party actually having been founded. It's more sort of a, a, a wish, a dream. She's raising funding at the moment, and we're not at all clear where all of the funding is coming from. Um, she, I attended a, a, a reading. Uh, she was reading from her um, one of her books, and it was an absolutely fascinating evening um, where she she's basically offering leftist but particularly eastern voters sort of a, a narrative of everything she's basically saying we're living in a, a very complicated world there's increasingly more conflicts and we need to remind people that you cannot solve conflict with military means and this plays very well particularly with an eastern audience who would have a, a more pro-russian anti-american outlook and definitely strong pacifist tendencies um and it's all what about is you know of course russia's attack and Ukraine contravenes international law and is without justification, but, and then she launches into sort of anti-American attack and she basically says that Zeitenben, the transformation of German foreign policy that Schultz announced is just sort of a PR strategy um, and it's about militarizing Germany um, and uh, yeah, it's nobody's asking the who benefits questions. And she's basically saying, you know, in particular, Germany's leftist liberals who were, would have been pacifists in the past and are now, um, she says, they're now examples of Prussian militarism who still feel entitled to, quote, excommunicate critics of the war in Ukraine as, as pacifist rabble. So this plays very well with an Eastern audience. I'm not sure how well it plays in the, well in the West, but we're not sure where this is going with her. The party may not actually come about. Um, but it's definitely a wild card and it could, um, many people believe it could see a lot of AFD voters being pulled away. Um, people, political political um, theorists much smarter than I are talking about horseshoe politics. So that you've got the AFD on the right, uh, extreme right, and Sarah Wagenknecht is extreme left and somehow their policies are almost touching. So what something that she'll pull voters across from the extreme right AFD, um, others are afraid that she will actually um, 
join forces with them at some point that there is very little separating separating uh, their politics um on israel listen i could talk for 25 minutes on israel you've probably been following that i've just got an eye on the clock so i'll i'll keep it short um i mean schultz it took schultz two attempts in the bundestag i thought was quite interesting to actually mention gaza um in the first reference he talked about our history our responsible responsibility rising from the holocaust makes our constant task to stand up for the existence and security of the state of israel this responsibility guides us in a second speech, uh, this was after the von der Leyen fuss when she went to Israel and, and didn't necessarily mention the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. He did mention Gaza as well, but very much that they are hostages of um, Hamas. Um, the, from an Irish perspective, I think it's quite interesting that we have Dyke Potzel, the former German ambassador to Ireland, who's now been appointed as humanitarian um, envoy for the foreign ministry, well, effectively for the for the federal government i had an interview with her a couple of weeks ago if you haven't read it i definitely um, recommend going back and reading it i won't go back through it but she's basically full-time i was just texting with her yesterday she's very long days um and um i was i did challenge her i said you know is germany a soft touch uh, for israel is can can israel pretty much do anything as far as germany's concerned and she says no that's not the case and she was very she said obviously we have our historical responsibility towards israel and its security um but she said we've had very frank and very open talks with all rele relevant players in this regard in terms of her priorities are getting humanitarian aid in uh, securing the situation for humanitarian workers and getting german uh, german citizens out and but when i pressed her she said look i mean we can lots of people are, are, are the criticism is hailing down on, on israel from outside but the, you know she didn't say this but her, the implication was do you really think israel is impressed by it? And that she says we have in germany have built up a relationship with israel from the most terrible beginnings to a relationship of trust um where where there is mutual respect people are listening on each side so she said if 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 a country like germany starts criticizing in discrete terms, in back rooms, not um, megaphone diplomacy, she said, you know, you'd like to think that will have a different impact than, let's say, Sweden or in Ireland, who has had its quite a robust public stance. I'm not sure, uh, this is my own interpretation, how much that will impress anyone in. So sometimes friends uh, or close friends, criticism from them, I think, is that the line coming from Berlin sometimes might be listened to uh, more closely. Um, I really we could go on and on about that. I haven't even gotten to the debt break, so I'll, I'll finish up with the debt break. Uh, you've probably been following it very closely. In simple terms, what Schultz and his government tried to do was they discovered, before he even became chancellor, 60 billion was left over from corona funding. They said, oh, I know, why don't we put a new label on that old wine bottle? And we can use that for, in particular, climate spending. We can use it for... Um, Oh, all sorts of things, um, uh, re renovating Germany's train system, um, which has fallen into terrible disrepair. And the Constitutional Court says, no, you can't do that. You went to us looking for emergency money. These things you're talking about are emergencies in their own way, but that's that's normal politics. You need to fund that out of day-to-day -day spending, which is a problem because Germany has what it's called the debt break, um, dating back to the, to the euro crisis. No more than 0.35% of GDP can be borrowed by politicians, which means that if you have no growth, which is at the moment Germany has no growth, you have no borrowing. So um, we have, so ending up where we started, we have a government trying to square the circle. It is a has a liberal finance minister, leftist major majority party, and a green uh, left in its heart, um, but with great, great uh, climate spending project uh, ambitions, and there's no money for any of this. So um, Germany has basically tied itself up in knots here, and debt is still the great taboo for Germany, even if it's literally cutting into its own flesh. So we're in the middle of that debate. We're not sure where that's going, uh, and there, there could be serious implications, as I've heard today, for, on on European on the European budget debate. But anyway, the debt the debt break, like Israel, is 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 enough to talk about for an entire hour. But it's twenty five past two, so I suggest I leave it there, and we go to questions.